listening to Daily Paul Radio, revolutionary talk for revolutionary times. WGRR Digital. Welcome back to Blue Republican Radio for the Liberty Curious. This is Robin Kerner, the original Blue Republican. And my guest today is a good friend of mine, a Mr. C. Michael Pickens. Now, Michael is the executive director of the Libertarian Party of Washington State and also author of the book Libertarian Leadership, Planting the Seed for a Libertarian Future. Michael, thank you for joining me today. How are you? Robin, thank you for having me. I am doing fantastic. Now, I'm um, at the west end of the state, and right now you're at the east end, right? Yes, I'm in Spokane currently. What are you doing over there? Um, I am organizing a couple campaigns, and this is actually where I live. So, All right. Well, that's a good enough reason to be there. But you yeah, travel a lot, you travel a lot over, across the state, right? I mean, you're, you're always traveling, it seems to me. Pretty frequently. I was there last weekend, and I'll be there this weekend. Okay, now tell, tell my listeners a little bit about what your position as executive director actually entails. Like, what's a typical week for you? Typical week is organizing campaigns, helping to organize uh, county organizations, upcoming meetings, um, some of the marketing that's involved with our upcoming campaigns. Um, right now, we have a focus to have at least one libertarian on the ballot in every district in Washington State, and there's 49 districts. So this is a pretty big undertaking for us, considering in 2012, there were zero libertarians on the ballot running for state office. And that's not to mention, you know, Gary Johnson, who was on the ballot. Right, right. So basically, we're going from zero to 49 in two years, right? Yeah. And, you know, I actually think we're going to have over 49 because right now we have a couple of districts with two libertarians on the ballot. So there's two representative seats per district. Now, this this speaks to why I wanted to get you on the show, Michael, because I mean, I know that you, you've invited me to speak at a lot of events that, that you arrange um, in your capacity as executive director of the LP up here in uh, Washington state. And a passion that we share is kind of making liberty, libertarianism mainstream, right? Because we've been sure. such a minority sport for a long time. But one of the reasons that I'm attracted to the work that you're doing is that you seem to me in many ways, along with other, many of your kind of great colleagues in the LP, um, to kind of embody this new blood, this kind of new generation of, um, of pragmatism. Uh, yeah. There's a sense in which, you know, the LP was kind of rather austere, populated by white male computer programmers that just wanted to talk to you about, you know, the creature from Jekyll Island. And that hasn't worked too well for the LP, has it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it hasn't. All right. So, so what's changing now? So the, there's a new group of younger libertarians and older libertarians as well. They kind of, you know, that were involved with the Ron Paul campaign in the Republican Party, or they just have come to the realization that it's more about principle versus party. That Yeah, the Libertarian Party is just a vehicle to get our principles across and then hopefully get some candidates elected. But it's not the only vehicle for that. So last year I was fortunate enough to be invited to speak at the Republican Liberty Caucus convention here in Washington state. Right. And we've invited them to speak at our convention. So, you know, we're just reaching out and trying to bring in Liberty activists from, you know, wherever, wherever they want to work, wherever they want to be, you know, whether it's the LP or the Republican party, whether they're independent or even, you know, there's a few in the Democrat Party as well. I, I wish you'd introduce them to me because I'm still trying to find these guys. Yeah, they're more of the left-leaning libertarians that are starting to come over. Interesting, interesting. So basically what's going on now is a more ecumen – from within the LP – is a more ecumenical approach to liberty and to actually winning elections, right? Yes. So uh, before – before this last convention, the Libertarian Party of Washington was unable to support or endorse candidates from other political parties. Well, we got a bylaw change passed through at our last convention, so now we're able to do that, and we've got a few Republicans and an independent who will be asking for our endorsement at our upcoming convention. You know, right. we figured 
you know, we're focusing on the issues, not focusing on the party label. And that's important. And yet the flip side of that is there are more people running as libertarian. I mean, you're expecting to actually have, therefore, more wins for the LP. Yeah, we're actually uh, I'm expecting there to be more liberty libertarians than liberty Republicans or liberty Democrats throughout the state. Right. Now, we're talking here about Washington state. To what extent does what you're doing in Washington reflect what's going on in the rest of the country? Is this just like a Pacific Northwest thing or is this change take, you know, picking up across the nation for the LP? Uh, For the most part, no. Um, But there are a couple other states that are following suit. Um, And actually, there was another state before Washington that made this bylaw change, and that was the state of Florida. And Mm -hmm. they're kind of doing the same thing. And have they seen any results from that? You know, they have uh, Lucas Overby, who's running a special election right now. And he was the first libertarian who's ever uh, been on a nationally televised debate. And they, you know, they're running a, a whole slew of candidates down there. And I think they're doing a fantastic job. OK, so more broadly, what do you, I mean, I've obviously got strong opinions about, you know, what the failures of the, the liberty movement um, sure. in recent times. What what do you have to say to that? What do you think the liberty movement has been? Um, where where have they been going wrong? And what's the low hanging fruit that you are now picking? Okay, so in the past, what I found with the Libertarian Party is that whenever someone new came in, they were given the Libertarian Purity Test, and that if they right. didn't you know score a hundred percent or they w- didn't agree a hundred percent on every single issue, they were kind of ridiculed for that and banished from the party, or they were just ridiculed and. The, the person didn't want to come back, and it makes sense. And we have more of a big tent attitude. Um, there's a website called isidewith.com that you can take a test that will actually determine what political party you more closely side with. Now, you know, we have candidates who've scored 74% libertarian. We have candidates who've scored 98% libertarian. But we're, we're bringing them all on board as long as they have libertarian at the top. They agree with us on most issues. And that's where we're really going to reach the mainstream because of a lot, a lot of our candidates. They're regular people, you know, and we want to see common sense solutions that can be implemented now. I understand the vision of the future on what we'd like to see, what would be ideal, but we have to take this one step at a time. Yeah, you're with me that it's about direction, not destination, right? Yes, yeah, what do they say? The journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. Absolutely, absolutely. And and, and the problem that we that that we have among kind of the the orthodox types is that we refuse to take a step until we've all we've all agreed exactly where the ten thousand miles is going to put us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of it's kind of now I, we've only got a f- couple of minutes left in this segment. But I mean, why do you think that Johnson, you know, in the presidential elections last time, basically polled? Just 1%, even with the Ron Paul tailwinds. Oh, I think I know exactly what happened. Go on. Um, to get a libertarian elected president, you first have to elect libertarians to state office. Mm. Okay, it's all about the local game. The local game will build on more of a national level. Um, and here in Washington state, to become a major political party, your presidential candidate has to at least get 5% of the last you know, presidential election. Right. Now, the only way we can do that is if we have libertarians running in every district, basically explaining to people what a libertarian is. Mm -hmm. You know, this this is, you know, libertarianism 101. If someone doesn't know what the word means, they're not going to vote for you. Yeah. And and do you find that that's the main problem that I mean, literally at the most basic level, people don't know what the word means. Yes, it is. It's the main problem. It's what I, what I find when I go out to networking events that are not libertarian based, whether they, they're business or other, you know, nonprofit events. And I introduce myself as executive director of the Libertarian Party. The number one question I get is, what is a libertarian? Really? Yep. Yeah. So does this mean then that perhaps we don't have to worry quite as much about the, um, the negative image that I sometimes warn about that's associated with the word libertarian, because for most people, it just doesn't have an image. It's a clean slate. Yeah, there, there are people who you know, pay attention to politics and they associate libertarians with you know, Republicans or Tea Party. Um, they, there are some people who associate libertarians with liberal Democrats you know, because of our social issues. And those, 
those are uh, things that we have to get over and we have to overcome. And the only way to do that is by running, you know, campaigns that uh, expressly, uh, you know, define what a libertarian is in our own terms. Right, right. Now, we've only got a minute left in this segment. What's happening to the um, just to the rank and file membership of the LP right now? I can tell you right now that here in Washington state, we're growing very rapidly. Last year, we had the most well-attended state party convention in the entire country, and our upcoming convention in three months has almost a third of the spots, the tickets sold for it. So we're growing fast, and we're, we're pretty active in our recruiting, and that's going to grow even faster as we have more campaigns pop up. Congratulations to you for kind of having that success, because I know like you're really at, in many ways at the top of that um, you know, of what's going on there. Uh, so um, what is it? <laughs> I mean, if you can answer this in 30 seconds without being too immodest, what is it that's making uh, you so successful here, more successful than uh, state LPs around the country? Oh, you know what? Answer that when we come back from this break. Welcome back, everyone, to Boom Republican Radio for the Liberty Curious. And uh, before we went to the break, I was asking my guest, C. Michael Pickens, executive director of the Libertarian Party of Washington State, to what he attributes the unusual success that he has had up here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, Robin. So there are a few things. Um, I come from a background of marketing and sales, and I think the main thing that, that has helped our success is our communication. Um, when I came on board 13 months ago, uh, we completely redid our website. Um, we started a new email marketing campaign. And also, when anyone fills out a form on our website, whether it's to volunteer, run for office, or get more information, they get a response. They right. get a response, they get a live person, they get connected with other libertarians that are local to them. It's the simple so, things then, right? It is. It's, it's simple stuff. And a lot of that, though, comes down to manpower. <clears throat> I mean, you need just people to actually write those responses to make those calls, right? So, Most definitely. So the fact that you're having that success, does that reflect an increase in the manpower that's available to, to you now in the LP? Oh, most definitely. Our volunteer base is huge now because of that. How huge is huge? Well, I would say we have over 100 volunteers easily around the state. Okay. And that's quite large for, uh, you know, for a state across the country? Well, you got to look at this. Uh, people who send in their information to volunteer, they may do it on a whim. Um, so to get people who are actually committed enough to take action uh -huh. is uh, kind of unique. Now, how integrated is, like, is the LP? I mean, do you work kind of in a silo as Washington State? Like if I go to Oregon or to Idaho, you know, next door either way um, – are they working closely with you or not? Is it like 50 kind of mini parties? How does it, how does it feel to work in the LP in, in the kind of position you do? You know, we have communications with uh, a couple different state libertarian parties, but for the most part, we are a silo. There are 50, 50 different uh, organizations okay. that are separate from each other. Now, does that, need though... to, does that need to be changed, Michael? Is that a problem? You know what? It does need to be changed, and it, it starts at the national level. Um, right now, we have a national party that sends back less than 1% of all the, the funds that they raise back to the state organizations. And there, there's really very little support that comes back to our state party. So what actually is the national LP doing with that money, the other 99%? I mean, give us a, give us a sense. You know, they do spend a lot on ballot access. There's quite a few states that have pretty rigid ballot access laws where you have to collect, you know, 50,000 signatures just to get the libertarians on the ballot. Okay. Whereas here in Washington, we can handle the petitioning ourselves because it's, it's something like 1,600 signatures. So we don't really need any help with that. Um, they send out a newsletter. I know they have staff at their national office in Washington, D.C. But the, the money I don't think is going to where it needs to be, and that is in marketing. Right. Now, you know, and then also ahead. affiliate support, and that's state party support. So I say that again, affiliate support? Affiliate support, yes. So they, out of the $1.1 million budget, they've only allocated $6,500 to affiliate support. Goodness. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a small fraction of our budget now, in Washington State. So now, you know, you have all of these candidates and, uh, that are coming up, and you're starting local. Um, now... What actually, what's going to be the core of your message? I mean, we talked a bit about messaging. Tell us something about what 
statements these campaigns are going to be making? Like, what's the message that's going to bring people around to the Libertarian Party? Bearing in mind that so few, yeah, that, that the Libertarian Party has had so little to say that's actually worked in getting, you know, votes. So there, there's one unified message that all of our candidates are going to carry and that the state party is going to push as well all across the state. And you have to remember that each different district is unique. There's certain districts in Seattle that are very liberal and then on the east side of the state, very conservative. And there's, you know, some swing districts in there as well. But the one issue that we're going to rally around is, is cronyism, it's corruption. And this is the thing here in Washington state. We can actually look at all the campaign contributions that come in to the, the candidates from the Republicans and the Democrats. And what we found is that every single incumbent has been taking money from out-of-state corporations. They take money from in-state corporations, from PACs, from special interest groups, right? And a, a huge percentage of that money, you know, anywhere from 90 to 98 percent of the campaign contributions that they collect comes from these special interest groups. And then you could take the money that comes in. For example, you have Representative Eileen Cody, who's a Democrat in the 34th District, who's, who recently uh, had a bill passed through the House to restrict medical marijuana, basically stripping medical status to marijuana in the state. Well, you look at her campaign contributors, and half of them are pharmaceutical comp companies from around the country. You know, right. and then you look at the Boeing bill, the Boeing. Uh, bill that added extra subsidies to Boeing, to aerospace training, tax breaks to this one company. And, you know, you have the aerospace lobby that's donating to these candidates. You have Boeing PAC that's do donating to these candidates. So you can tie the contributions back to the way that the candidate or the, the incumbents have been voting, the bills that they're sponsoring, the bills that they're co-sponsoring. So we've actually done all the research and we're going to be pointing this out come right. uh, May 19th after the end of the filing period so, all across the state. So this isn't something that you've kind of actually gone out with yet because we're still a little early. We're still kind of in preparation mode, right? But this is going to be the push when it comes in May. You know, we've been starting to talk about it, starting to talk about dropping the hammer on corruption in the state of Washington. And we've gotten some really good response already. And our campaigns that have already announced, they're starting to do the same thing. And they're picking up volunteers. They're getting donations from individual citizens. Right. So yeah. we're already having some initial success with it. And once we once we really launch this thing on May 19th, um, all across the state, I'm sure we're, our success level is going to increase. Now, this reminds me of an article that I wrote, I think about a year ago, the Liberty Movement Must Ask the Most Important Question. And in that article, I was talking about how it has never been the case that massive political change towards liberty has happened because, you know, some uh, political ideologues have managed to educate an entire nation in some new world view. I think that's what maybe a lot of liberty folks have been doing, have been trying to do for generations. And as it always does in history, it's failed. The, the way you actually turn the ratchet one notch towards liberty is always in reaction to some broadly sensed um, injustice, political, cultural injustice. And the one that you're speaking to here is one of the two of our time, crony corporatism, the other one being the complete civil rights abuses that we're all being subjected to. And the sure. great thing about focusing on something like this, the reason why I really support what you do, Michael, um, is, is that you know, history tells us that that works, that if you want to make a uh, broad-based political change, it's about... Uh, stimulating, as it were, the, the sense of unfairness of, you know, my tomorrows aren't going to be as good as my yesterdays because something is being done to me that just is, is at some level wrong. And you don't need a political ideology to have that feeling. You know, this sense of crony, this crony corporatism that we see around us all, all over the place, it offends everybody, left, right, and in the middle. It really is common sense. And we've got to find that one issue, that big one issue, and it, it, I think you found it, um, to actually hook people who otherwise just might not be very interested in political philosophy or whatever. Sure. You know, it's one thing to accuse these guys of corruption and cronyism, but it's another thing to actually have the data to right. back it up and then the votes, their votes, to actually show the proof where, look, here, this is how they're voting. They're voting, you know, with their corporations, with their special interest groups. Who do they represent or who should they represent? And is, no. th is this something, is this approach something that, as far as you know, is likely to be copied um, anywhere else uh, by, so. by state LPs? 
I hope so. And one thing that I talk about in my book is leading by example. You know, we don't have the experience yet to see how this is going to work. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to be the ones to lead the way right. and see if it works and see how it works and see, you know, where we can improve along the path. And if it's successful and if we get some libertarians elected, actually, I should say when we get libertarians elected to state office, there will be libertarian parties from around the country will be asking us how we did it. And yeah. that makes it a much easier way to convince people, leading by example. And do you at least feel... Are you aware of any kind of moral support from the national party or, or is it – or is that just like not even a thing? Sure. They, they'd like to see oh, us succeed. They'd like you know, to see everyone. Hold on, Michael. Succeed. Hold on a second. I'm going to interrupt you. We're going into the break. We'll carry on when we come back. Sure. All right. Thanks, mate. You're listening to Daily Paul Radio, revolutionary talk for revolutionary times, WGRR Digital. Welcome back, you're listening to Robin Turner, the original Blue Republican, and I'm talking to Michael Pickens, whom I asked a question before we went to um, the last break. I asked Michael uh, whether he feels he's getting moral support from National for his uh, kind of really mo modernizing practical efforts here in Washington State that are proving so successful. Michael. You know, Robin, there's no doubt in my mind that libertarians from all across the country, whether they're party members or just activists or, you know, people who love liberty, they, they want to see our success. They want to see us be successful. And that includes the, the people who work at the national office and our leadership all around the country and national. You know, we just may have different opinions on how we're going to get there, different ideas on the actions we need to take and different ideas on the speed we, which we need to move, which brings me back to a talking point that I like to bring up a lot when I, when I do speeches to you know, libertarian organizations, is that there's two types of libertarians that I see out there. There's, um, if you're familiar with the libertarian porcupine, right, this is a mascot that's widely known as the... You know, mm -hmm. the unofficial mascot of the Libertarian Party, and then what I ca like to call the Libertarian Lions. Now, Libertarian Porcupines, they're, they're a de defensive animal, right? Porcupines have the spikes that stick out. They're slower moving, right? And then you have li Lions, which are very aggressive, very proactive. You know, they move fast. A and that's what I look at the Libertarians who are leading Washington State. We're more of a lion versus a porcupine. You know, we're looking at how we can take back the liberties that have already been stolen from us. How do we challenge uh, the Republicans and Democrats on every level to to really put up a fight? Because this is something that's that's serious to me. It's very serious to us. Losing our liberty is not something to play around with or to take it slow. No, we have to move fast. We have to move decisively. You know, we got to take action. Michael, I'm I haven't. I don't think I've ever asked you this question, and this might be a strange stage in the show to ask it, but how did you get into the liberty movement? And how did you, you know, what made you become so passionate about it to the point that you basically spend your life doing this? You know, I, I grew up as a social conservative. Um, my dad was a social conservative, and it was actually 2007. I was watching a Fox News debate. I believe it was the first one, and there was a guy up on stage talking about how uh, the terrorists don't hate us because we're free and prosperous prosperous. They hate us because we've been over there meddling in their business and bombing them since 1953. And that kind of struck a chord with me like, oh, really? I didn't know that. You know, you don't mm. hear that from traditional mainstream Republicans. So I, I looked into it more and that guy was definitely Ron Paul, yeah. as you can, uh, can guess or yeah. imagine. Yeah. And that's how I, you know, I just delved more into the ideas of libertarianism. You know, and then after he he lost the primary, I kind of took a break from it and then got more excited back in 2011, came back into it. But this time I came back into the Libertarian Party versus the Republican Party because I was tired of the, the infighting and just the, the mean spiritedness I got back in 2007, 2008. Now, you touched earlier on the fact that, you know, we want people to. This is a broad-based fight, right? There are people in the Libertarian Party. There are people in no party. There are, you know, people in the Republican Party. There are even people in the Democratic Party. There are people who are affiliated with certain foundations or organizations. Um, and, and you and I, I think, share this idea that there is no one path, right? There's no single panacea. This works precisely because people are uh, doing it the way that makes most sense 
to them, right? Sure. Uh, it, this isn't an either or, is it? it? It helps to have a libertarian, to have a third party uh, doing this. It helps to have people inside the Republican Party. It helps to, um, I mean, hopefully, you know, as I say, get more people in the Democratic Party and no party at all. I mean, I should say, actually, that, you know, Blue Republican, as we're establishing uh, chapters, state chapters around the country. We actually now have people running for office who are running actually as libertarians, uh, like Chris Hernandez down in Houston. He's the Blue Republican chair for Houston. We have right. Tisha Cassida, who's running unaffiliated on principle. She's the Republican chair for Colorado. Um, and uh, we've got a gentleman called Harara who's up in New Jersey, and he's uh, running as a Republican. And I love this kind of, you know, we say principle before party. We're actually doing that. I know that you're actually doing that with like your outreach up here in Washington, as you mentioned earlier to the RLC. What message do you have for, I mean, I see that, you know, I write articles, as you know, and I get these comments sometimes and people are like, you know, oh, the RL, you know, the Republican Party, forget about it. After they, they did what they did, it's a lost cause. And then you have like the other type saying, oh, my God, you're completely wasting your time in the Libertarian Party. You know, it's just so <laughs> unrealistic because it's a two party state. If you're not in, if you're not in the Republican Party, you're fighting a lost cause. What, what do you say to these people on either side of that kind of thing? There's been too long where libertarians, big L and small L alike, have been facing inward in a circle arguing with each other. That's right. Okay? We need to turn around, face outward, and go out in the community and build support. That's how we'll, we'll win elections, regardless if it's a Republican or a libertarian on the ballot. And th that's what we're doing. You know, I was I spoke at the RLC convention last year. The RLC, you know, hopefully we'll have a, a booth at our convention and we'll have a speaker there as well. And, you know, surprisingly or not, we're talking with o Occupy Seattle, you know, yes. Socialists and Green Party to have a booth at, at our convention and to talk about the issues where we agree upon and then the issues where we don't, we could leave those at the door. And yeah. we're adult enough and mature enough to be able to do that. Yeah. You know, yeah. focus where we agree and we can agree on that corruption is a bad thing. We all agree with that. If, if you know, you don't find you can't find someone to say that I like corruption and we need more of it in politics. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. So we can agree on that one issue and let's lead with that issue and let's bring everyone on board. But let me tell you what, there are going to be some elections, some races where we're going to have a conflict. Mm -hmm. Right. Where there may be a libertarian and there may be a, a liberty Republican on the ballot. And that's just that's just how it is. But let's not attack each other. You know, let's go after the the authoritarian candidate or the Democrat or the more mainstream Republican right. candidate. Yeah. And, and that that can work. You know, for example, down in the 17th district, that's Vancouver, Washington. We have Chris Rockhold who's running as a libertarian for position two and Linda Wilson, who's running as a Liberty Republican for position one. Now I've got someone to run in position one as a libertarian, but we're not going to run them because, you know, Linda Wilson is an RLC candidate and we've, you know, talked about it and we're going to work together in that district. And are you feeling Michael, uh, that we are getting, I mean, the libertarian party is getting, um, or will soon get reciprocation in this respect. Oh, most definitely. And we're already getting that, you know, RLC members coming over to help libertarian campaigns. You know, wow. they understand that we're all friends and, that you know, we're brothers. We're, you know, this is how we're, it's supposed to work in a civilized society. Yeah. Yeah. Big tent, big tent liberty. I mean, if you think about it, exactly. you know, if liberty had a tent, one tenth the size of the Democrats or Republicans, I mean, it would be a game changer, right? Well, you know, when you look at activist base from around the state, um, <clears throat> what I've heard from party leadership from both the Democrats and the Republicans, they, they maybe have you know, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 really active party leaders Okay. You know, around the state. And you look at the conventions, and this is the first year that I see that the libertarians in the state of Washington will have a convention. The size of our convention – will be able to compete with the Republicans and almost compete with the Democrats in terms of convention attendance size. Now, do you, that, that, I mean, it makes me think of an interesting, I think an interesting phenomenon that I maybe haven't thought too much about. I remember, um, you know, when Ron Paul was pulling in 10,000 people to these stadiums, right? Back in 2012, where he was on sure. the campaign. And then, 
you know, the vote count. I mean, so few of those people actually, it seemed, turned out to vote um, for the closest thing to Ron Paul. I mean, as you know, Blue Republican was born uh, out of support for Ron Paul, and we ended up actually mm-hmm. endorsing the Libertarian Party candidate, Gary Johnson. Um, so, and, and I'm pleased to say I know loads of the, the majority of Blue Rep- uh, Republicans, kind of self-identified Blue Republicans, did turn out and vote uh, Gary Johnson, and a good sure. proportion uh, you know, did turn out to write in Ron Paul. Um, but... There seems to be this gap, or there has been this gap, between people who kind of come to the events and kind of want to feel it, right? Want to be in the room, getting excited with other people of like mind. And then those that actually just will, will, will bother to, you know, press the, the button on the die bulb machine for the candidate. Is that, is that a problem for us? Is that more of a problem for us than for any other party? Or am I wrong about that? You know, it goes back to motivation. How motivated are these activists to actually knock on doors? You know, it's not an easy thing to knock on a a stranger's door and talk to him about liberty, but it's something that has to happen. Yeah. You know, Samuel Adams, one of our founding fathers, is known for going, you know, bar to bar talking about the principles of liberty and talking about revolution. You know, and he has a a great quote It does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. So it comes down to, yeah, are you willing to knock on doors? Are you willing to make phone calls? Are you willing to do what's necessary to spread the message of liberty and to convert people who are Republican, Democrat, or, or, you know, or statist, right, authoritarian, or those who just think the whole system screwed? And there's nothing they can do. There's a lot of those people out there that we have to show them, look, there's something we can do now. That's why we have a goal of having a libertarian on the ballot in every single district. So because my marketing background tells me that if there's no libertarian to vote for, there's no product to buy. No matter how good our ideas are, if, if you can't vote for a libertarian, then what's the point? People won't turn out. And one thing that we've discussed is, uh, you know, there's that old cliche that, you know, you have to be exposed to a message 14 times or, you know, it used to be yeah. seven, now it's 14 before you, <laughs> it begins to have a chance of affecting your behavior. And a lot of it is kind of, is just exposure, right? Is yep. seeing the word libertarian um, or the logo of the party in a kind of mainstream context a few times over. I mean, it, it works at that, that kind of simple level. Yeah, and that's what we have to continue to do put our logo, put our message in front of, of, front of people. That's why it's so important to run campaigns, libertarian campaigns, where it's going to say libertarian, because then people who wouldn't normally get to see that, people here in Washington State who've never seen a libertarian run for state office in their district are finally going to get to experience that. And not to mention, not just this 2014 election season, but every one of our candidates, one of the requirements we have is that they commit to running for office again if they lose. Right. Right. We're running to win. But if they lose, they're committing to running for local office in 2015 and then again for state office in 2016. What would you say to uh, and you're you're probably the right person to ask this. If if there's somebody listening to this and and I I haven't got the exact figures yet, but I'm hearing that we're getting thousands of downloads now. So there's a good chance there are people who are listening to this. They obviously love liberty because otherwise they wouldn't be even bothering to listen to this. And they might be toying with the idea of getting involved in electoral politics. And it probably seems like a lot of work. They probably have a lot of uncertainty. What, What would you say to them? Whether or not they're interested in running Libertarian Party or not, what would you say to them as they approach a decision to just get involved uh, in officialdom. So I, I have a document that I wrote called Things to Consider Before Deciding to Run for Office. And, you know, in this document, I talk about the pitfalls of running, the challenges that you're going to have to face while you're running for office. But the main thing people need to understand is that you just have to, to take the jump, just take that first step, and you're going to learn along the way. And as long as you commit to personal development, to personal growth, to learning all the aspects of running a campaign, you will eventually be successful. You know, the the establishment has people within their organizations who've been running campaigns for 20, 30, 40 years. Libertarians, we don't have that yet, but that is something that we have to commit to. So, you know, yeah. I, I make sure that candidates know what they're getting into and what they should expect. And there's been potential candidates who've decided, like, no, right now is not the time. I'll maybe run again in the future because of my document. But 
I want people who understand that they're committing, you know, not just this election, but the next election and the following election to running for office, to building that experience base, and then being able to teach and mentor other up and coming candidates as well. I like this approach that you're taking. It's kind of a longer term approach to actually build organizational knowledge. Yes. Yep. And, you know, chapter five of my book is all about mentorship all about mentorship and there's some that's something that the libertarian party has been lacking Mm. you know you got someone who runs for libertarian runs as a libertarian one year and then doesn't run again and just quits after that instead of taking all the things they've learned you know crap i should have done this differently i should have done this differently i should have should have done this differently and instead of running again and doing them differently they just stop and that's that we can't have that anymore this is why i'm so excited about like what tisha is doing in colorado she's the the Mm -hmm. the lady who i I told you is running unaffiliated she ran um, for the last cycle. And I am just so excited about what she's going to do this cycle for no other reason that she's just got this wealth of knowledge. I mean, she worked so hard and so she learned so much. Yeah. Um, and I really will not be surprised to see her in Congress one day. I really will not be because she's competent. She's excited. And now she's, you know, really knowledgeable. You know, Robin, we're going to start seeing libertarians elected to state office all across the country because there's more and more people who are realizing this. Right. You know, that there's a great saying, it's called fail forward fast. And the, the more you fail, the faster you're going to learn. A lot of people think that there's two paths in life, one that leads to success and another path that leads to failure. But people don't understand that there's only one path <laughs> and success is at the end. And along that path, there's all these different failures that you have to go through. Call them hurdles, call them, you know, potholes, whatever you want to call it, you know, you, you have to go through those failures. And once you go through them, this is a thing, though, and you learn from them, they're, it's no longer a failure. It's a lesson. Yeah, absolutely. The next, time, the next time that red flag, that same red flag pops up, like here's this pothole, right? You're going to see it and you can go around it. You can avoid it. Yeah. So. yeah. Now, we've only got like 50 seconds left in this uh, segment. Um, but you are going to be talking about some of these issues with me. In actually the, on June the 1st, right here in Seattle. And, yeah. uh, and then I hope you and I are going to be taking what we're putting together uh, much further afield. In the last half minute, could you just speak to that? Sure. We're going to be putting on a workshop training on. Uh, oh, you know what? Convention. I'm sorry. You know what? I got the timing wrong. Hold it. We'll come back in the final segment and discuss it. Sure. All right. Thank you for staying with us, uh, Michael. I was just asking you to tell the listeners about uh, what we have planned to do together. Sure. This is something that I'm very excited about. Um, it's trainings, workshops, interactive webinars, and videos uh, talking about some of the princi- principles that I bring up in my book, Libertarian Leadership, as well as my upcoming book, uh, The Hero in Your Soul, which is going to be a mix between Sun Tzu's The Art of War and kind of modern day politics. Um, so my session, or my section in the training is going to be based on emotional intelligence and some of the foundational needs to be able to expand our comfort zone, to be able to knock on doors and not worry about what other people think, to get us through the down times when, when we experience one of these you know, so-called failures, right, that will carry us through to the future successes we're going to have. Absolutely. And actually, uh, some of my listeners know that uh, the sales and marketing background that you know, we share, for my part, what I, you know, I bring that to this politics thing because I first came to America selling books door to door, you know, as like an exchange yeah. student. That was my thing. So I know very much what you're talking about. I love that we kind of hit it off on that level. We are sales and marketing people for Liberty. Liberty is our product. I'm going to be talking about uh, basic sales techniques Um, for selling the product of liberty. And I'm going to be putting that in some kind of context. You know, there's been plenty of work done in empirical psychology, social psychology, um, that we need to understand. (laughs) Like, it helps to actually have some kind of framing, even now neurology. So uh, if you come to listen to our session, you're going to get this great content from Michael. You're going to get a lot of this content from me. I actually go have been around the world for a few years now, giving lectures in this, The Art of Political Persuasion. And uh, I really believe that this has um, a good chance to make a big difference to many activists that we want to kind of pack into the room. And we, you and I, Michael, we want to be going around the country doing this for quite a long time, don't we? Most definitely. And this workshop scheduled for June 1st is actually going to be recorded. Uh, we have professional right. video. 
And, you know, we're going to do our best to get it out to as many people as possible because these ideas and these practices, uh, both within the RLC and the LP, they need to get spread out. People need to start working together. Now, what's the website? We've, got, we've just got a few seconds left. What's the website where people can sign up to come to that event and the LP conference? Real quick. Yes, it's lpwa.org. Thanks so much for being with me, Michael. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Until next week, have a good week. You're listening to Daily Paul Radio, revolutionary talk for revolutionary times, WGRR Digital.